you realize it's not just about social media you don't have a swiggy on it you don't have an uber on it you don't even have like a camera on it so yeah. you you can't take any photos it's not easy to just feel positive right sometimes when you force yourself to feel positive that that leads to toxic positivity in a way where you don't address underlying feelings or emotions people are in such a mad hurry this hustle culture mm-hmm. a lot of people say that this is toxic but they don't do anything about it they're just like oh my god this is killing me this is so bad this is not healthy but they never stop we live in a world where we constantly told to stay positive to stay in social media to stay out there for everyone to be but for us to really be able to evolve into the kind of people we can be it's so important to stay present not positive and in many ways to also detach ourselves from all the pressure the social media puts on you I had a chat a while back with poet Megha Rao, and she spoke to me about this, and we dwelled into this in long detail. And that's what I'm dropping for you guys today on Take a Pause with Me, Varun Dugirala. But before you go there, I want to make sure you hit subscribe and smash that bell icon. On to my chat with Megha. this is a chat i've been contemplating for a while and 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 i and i, I spoke to um, peter who i think very sweetly introduced us because i've been following your i i do i call it poetry do i call it content i think i i think i've been consuming most of the stuff you create um and one of the things that i really am intrigued by is understanding the processes of of creative people and someone who some people who are considered truly creative so um firstly thank you for coming on the show mega i'm i'm super excited for for where this chat uh what rabbit holes this chat might lead us through um and i'm also catching you at a time when you're on a bit of a break from all things social media and everything else so um thank you for taking time away from your digital detox to do this thank you so much for having me varun and you're right i'm i'm not sure if i can call it a digital detox what i can call it actually because a break sometimes you want to go cold turkey on something but you find yourself coming back to it and that's when you realize okay i might be addicted to this i don't know um but i'm trying my best to you know do this detox and also this social media break i think one of the first things that i did was get myself a dumb phone it was mm-hmm. incredibly tedious because you know <laughs> you realize it's not just about social media you don't have a swiggy on it you don't have an uber on it you don't even have like a camera on it so yeah. you you can't take any photos um but it was a very wholesome experience because i found myself being very present and i say that in the most non romantic non glorified way i also found myself reading this book called how to do nothing it's about um beating the attention economy it's by jenny odell it's a really yeah. really my sister sent book. me that because she says i've oh. i've spent too much time watching and do and just basically being on the phone and she literally sent me this book saying this is a book you of all people need to read so i know what <laughs> did she mean. find you um did she find you sitting at the dinner table on your phone not talking to her is that what happened Uh, my, my sister realized that i'm obsessed with the phone we don't live in the same country um she, she lives mm. uh, she lives in london and but she's like i know how much cuz whenever she's visited she's seen me just like walk around with the phone half the time or doing something or watching me on social media or creating content so she's like can you just like stop uh, i think that's why she <laughs> said this for artists so much of our work is also integrated with the mm. internet especially during times like these so sometimes mm. it does feel impossible and even when i'm saying i'm taking a break i know that comes with a lot of privilege because i know i can do it versus someone mm. who's just started out and needs to put out work you know put out their art out there and they're trying to like get an audience for it um or even someone who has a very big audience and grew mm. their audience on let's say like a twitter or an instagram and now it's just difficult for them to step back from it because almost you know you get work dms you get mm. that happens right and yeah. it's it's yeah, hard to dissociate yourself from it you know you mentioned being present and i feel that that's a term which i always think about it as just being there for people or just being there for yourself um i came across something very interesting sometime back it, it spoke about um, having present thinking versus versus positive thinking 
uh, and i found that super interesting because it said that what you're feeling right now might not be positive but it's present is where you are right now so when you're present with yourself like you said you've been able to kind of have that how you seen that like how does that help you reflect on yourself how how does that help do you reflect on just your headspace and and everything else you know before i go there i also wanted to add a lot of people talk about positive thinking mm. and i know you also you mentioned it right now being present versus positive thinking yeah. you know sometimes when you're going through something like which is which is what most of the population is going through right now because of the pandemic you're yeah. going through something and it it's not easy to just feel positive right sometimes when you force yourself to feel positive that that leads to toxic positivity in a way where you don't address underlying feelings or emotions so i think i think the best way forward for us would be present thinking like you mentioned mm-hmm. yeah um and rather than you know positive thinking which is why i try to stray away from that as much as possible even when i create episodes for poems to come down to mm-hmm. um because i know that okay sometimes it could sound very fluffy it could sound very you know sweet and good and it might you know dismiss the reality that you know the world may not necessarily be a great place for most yeah. of us right now yeah. but i think it's just important to stay grounded and focused on yeah this is real and um i can't i can't cross that i want to be happy i want to be in a safe space i want to be healthy but I don't want to fake positivity when I'm not feeling it. And that's one thing I realized when I started being more mindful, when I started, you know, like stepping back from everything, I had a lot of time to focus on myself. And by that I don't mean okay, I sat and I explored all these new talents and hobbies. I just mean that there was my voice in my head versus let's say like millions of other people's voices small small voices feeding into my thoughts giving me opinions ideas um you know and information that i don't even know if it's true so taking a step back reduce the noise for sure and being present was also just observing um i think that when i'm you know not on my phone and i'm not distracted i'm indulging in deep work which is something cal newport said right he mm, said yeah. that a lot of us um run on the surface on in the shallow i mean on the surface because we we're so distracted there are so many things happening around us all the time but when you indulge in deep work you're giving your 100% to that one thing that you're doing at that moment even if it means washing the dishes or watching tv whatever it is no distractions and i think that's one thing that i learned um i learned to just give my 100% for whatever small thing that i was doing and that's that was very insightful for me you know you mentioned washing dishes and i have a theory and i think in some parts i've been i, I feel like i've been proven right is that when you do something really mundane and it's mm-hmm. it's been something which i've realized that when you do something which is a very really regular task right you do just washing dishes you are uh, maybe just helping clean stuff at home or just like folding clothes I feel the best ideas kind of come to me at moments like that. <laughs> you doing something so mundane that it is by far the best time for your brain to kind of like really have on like 20 light bulbs going off. Um uh, do you find that as well? Do you have certain things that you kind of do which kind of spark creativity in you or or or, uh, or are there other acti- uh, other things that you find to be bigger sparks? I think it's a mix of both like um adventure definitely does push me into opening up my mind. but at the same time when i'm immersed in the ordinary i think i could come up with some really extraordinary things even then i've started believing that even the ordinary could be really extraordinary mm-hmm. um like something brilliant could come out of washing the dishes or yeah. maybe nothing at all and that's okay too you know like yeah. you don't have to be creating or indulging in an idea all the time you could have an idea and just leave it there and do nothing for that day and maybe it comes back to you later or doesn't it doesn't matter and i think that the beauty of that and and, and actually the beauty of what you created especially your podcast has had like a it's been on the instigator many times for me to kind of think about life and think about many things and etc but um 
I want to go back to the first ever episode you did, which was, uh, I don't know if that's the first one recorded, but it's the first one I, I went back to the first one, which is about taking a pause. Um, and there were many things you spoke about there. And, you, and I'm kind of circling back to the pause part before we move on to other points. Um, what do you feel has happened every time you've taken a pause at different stages um, of your creative journey? Have you seen that what you get out of it is different or have you seen some things kind of staying the same? Uh, what have you kind of seen over there? I think that once a writer has discovered his or her voice or a creator has discovered his or her or their voice, um, you're going to hold on to that for sure. But at the same time, um, there's going to be a lot of experimentation. And I think it's so important to have room for experimentation. I see writers and artists stereotyping themselves, putting themselves in a box once mm. something works. Oh, okay, this got 1 million. I'm just going 1 million views. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to do that for the rest of my life. And, you know, this is my calling. Yeah. I, I think that while an audience gets to decide what hits a 1 million listen um, mm. and what doesn't make it, we also need to look towards internal validation and that's something I'm doing right now like it's so hard when you're exposed to the world to not care about external validation which is why it's also so important to just be away for a while and I think that people are in such a mad hurry this hustle culture Mm -hmm. a lot of people say that this is toxic but they don't do anything about it they're just like oh my god this is killing me this is so bad this is not healthy but they never stop you know this, and that's not their fault because it's kind of become this this slot machine where they're getting instant validation and it's become a sort of rat race. So they feel pressurized to not stop. If they stop, then someone else might take that place. Um, and it's disappointing that that's what we've become. But at the same time, for someone like me, an artist, I think if... I don't want to become the kind of artist who seeks um, external validation. I mean, sure, we all we, we all want, want secretly, yeah. our work to be accepted for sure, yeah. but at the same time, not at the cost of our artistic integrity, right? And I think that's why it's so important. I just take a step back. I read a bunch of books every day. Um, I do the things that I don't get the time for. I don't ever want to end up writing more than I read. I don't think anyone should do that. Um, And, you know, even for creators, look at other stuff. Go back and see who created the history of what you're doing. I go back to my classics. I read everything that the history of literature has to offer me. And that's how I write. Writing just doesn't come from personal experiences and, you know, whatever you've learned in life. It doesn't work that way. It's just part of it. That's what helps you define your voice. But I don't know, when it comes to everything matters, you need inspiration. You need to look at what other artists are doing, even the ones deceased. You know, I, I want to take a little deeper into finding your voice, right? And I feel that especially in today's time, like you just mentioned, right? it's so easy for us to say, oh, this is what's working. Or, or like this is what the most popular, let's say, YouTubers or podcasters are doing. Let's follow that. Um, and in in the middle of that, sometimes you kind of, and I've seen some of the best pe- creators kind of turn around at some point and say, I don't know what my voice is anymore, right? You, you, you kind of go down that alley so far that you don't know how to go back. Uh, how do you kind of, if you have to uh, answer someone who's asking today, I'm starting today, I want to figure out what my voice is. What would you tell them? What would you... Uh, what do you turn to them and say? How how do they kind of find what is authentically them? As far as my journey of discovering my voice went, I think so much of it has to do with just understanding yourself. Um, it's very easy to be sidetracked by looking at someone else doing something and thinking, oh, that's working. I want to do that too. Hmm. And you you know that at the minute someone, um, some a particular kind of art goes up, there will be like 100 other people suddenly joining the bandwagon and going with the flow. Um, like Rupi Kaur came uh, into yeah. Vogue and suddenly there were like a lot of people writing, let's say, like very short poetry in a similar fashion, white background, two lines, artwork. Yeah. And I think that's where voice gets lost. For someone that could be their voice, 
but for someone else that could just be let's say imitation mm-hmm. and i think voice just comes from that very raw authentic space um maybe it has so much to do with who you are it definitely mm-hmm. has so much to do with who you yeah. are yeah. when i started writing i didn't set out thinking oh these are the themes that i'll write about i want to write in a fierce and powerful way not really mm. i would even go as far as saying that um before college the kind of writing that i used to do was very cheesy cute stuff which is i mean it is amazing i think that all art is beautiful but then i went to college and i went through a lot of stuff that was incredibly painful and i think that kind of trauma changed me and when i changed my writing changed as well it changed so much it had lost its innocence it had lost that sweetness it had become dark and you know painful it seemed like this open wound mm. and with time with time when that started settling when things started getting better i started growing my hair um i became you know just an overall healthier person that's when poems to come down to happen right then yeah. and you don't you don't see that kind of insanely dark poetry there mm. but you also don't see something that's sweet Fluff. and cute yeah. yeah you don't see that you see more like you see wisdom and mm. you see a lot of other things and i think but at the same time that doesn't mean that throughout all of this i you know my writing changed completely it was not like a um 180 360 i don't know but it it didn't change completely it changed mm. in many ways but at the bottom of it at the heart of it you could find brutal honesty no matter what you could find this fascination for exaggeration and metaphors you know for a long time yeah. when i was writing metaphors into my poetry i didn't even know i was doing that i had a friend tell me you know i want to find my voice you have such a unique voice the minute i read your poem you don't even have to tell me it's yours i know it's yours because you use all these metaphors and that's when i actually went back and read my poems and i thought oh that's right i tend to yeah. not call a spade a spade yeah. instead of saying oh that sunset is beautiful i end up calling it god spilling wine on the sky's party dress and you know all sorts of exaggerated stuff and i think it's a journey and i think it's so important to read a lot of people to understand what kind of writing you like and and this is not specific to writing right it could be any art it could be yeah. anything um i know i read a lot of writers and i was able to pick from that why i love what i loved about that book what i hated about that book and then i'd be like okay i'm going to take the part which i love which is let's say maybe the simplicity of that work mm-hmm. i'm going to be that way what did i hate about it? it it's so it's dragging i don't like the ending okay i want like a an, an ending with a punch so these are things you just figure out along the way but when you're exposed to too much information all the time when you don't get time to sit with yourself when you're you know growing up I don't know how people grew up on the internet like as a millennial I, I agree. it was it was difficult but gen z I'm terrified for them like I'm I'm genuinely terrified for them yeah and I, that's such an important point and I think we all grew up without I mean even when we got it at some point it was like yeah. dial up and you couldn't see half the things which were there on screen because nothing was buffering and but when I actually think about like and someone asked me the other day said how do i find, how, how do i acquire wisdom was a question i got right and i'm like <laughs> wow. that's such a tricky question to answer um uh, so i thought about it for a bit and i i generally try to respond to as many dms especially when someone who's young uh, writing in and i was like the you i only acquire wisdom by really like keeping your eyes and ears open as you go through life right and that's literally what i i turned around and said because what you just said about how you progressed as an artist is because as you progress through life you learn things you evolve things and you move ahead and that just changes so many parts of it. like when you were talking about having fluffy poetry i went through a jim morrison poetry phase <laughs> in my life which is by far one of the worst things i could have done like i go back i, I still have that book somewhere right and and my friends used to laugh at me saying dude he is not a good poet and i'm like well, i actually want to write like him so i tried to write like him i would shoot those you know random shadowy videos of myself talking about them uh, reading them out and stuff like that but I, i think that phase was important for me to get let a lot of the randomness out whereas now when i'm sitting down and writing i'm writing from a very like okay this is what i've been through and this is what i feel about today 
is like and i feel the problem with the internet is we see so much there we want to sound like the people whose content we consume so trying to ape someone i don't know when the flip happens i don't know if it's about age um, and and i want to ask you that at one at which point do you feel that it was a flip from okay this is what i'm doing cuz this seems to be what everyone does to being okay this is something i innately like understood what my you know in uh, voice inside is and and almost like figuring out i mean because i think poetry especially and this is a long winding question to when i'm you i mean I, even i'm figuring out where i'm going with this uh is that um, <laughs> while you're asking the question <laughs> yeah uh, because uh, poetry in the modern world is at an interesting sp- space because i i got introduced to a few people saying they are their favorite instagram poets and now that's a thing right um but how do you find the way to put it out into the world being different from how it might might have been when when you started off and i know it's it's been a period of time for you but um how have you kind of seen that change how you write sorry long question i think question. by trying different things um mm. i mean you should be thankful that i understood your question <laughs> this is the problem this is the problem when you start saying things and you go into a a different direction and you come back to it and you suddenly say one second where is the question what was i trying to say um so yeah so how you seen the way you broadcast things out there into the world really affect what um you put down okay so i'm going to answer this in two points because one thing you asked me was how i how to just like break out of that um you know stereotype or whatever you you know like you you, you know people put you in a box and like oh she's a spoken word poet no she's an yeah. instagram poet no she's just a poet you you don't know and and now that i have like a book out with harper collins yeah they're like oh, okay that's page poetry and i i find that really confusing and i think for me Oh, and then someone also called me. Oh, you're yeah, that podcast poet, and I was really confused. Mm. Like I was not. I don't know how I felt because for me, I think hearing all these terms, it's like someone else is deciding your identity for you. Mm. Um, and I, I, I found myself losing my free will there, and I, I, I didn't want that. But at the same time, I think to break out of like one stereotype, I started doing a lot of things. Right, that's why I started doing a. podcast and it wasn't necessarily because i wanted to break out of that but more because i just wanted to try out something new mm. even when i started performing even when i started like doing a podcast i knew at the heart of it it would be poetry um because because i, I am in love with poetry and i i know that whatever i do it's it's going to find its way there in in some way but i was thirsty to you know experiment with everything and that's kind of what helped me get past a particular stereotype like i was in boxed in because i was trying out so many new things um and in, and just having like a generally good time um but apart from that how do i detach myself from being influenced yeah. by let's say external voices is I think one of it is definitely this break that I'm taking mm-hmm. for sure and by that I'm not going to define what it is because I'm allowing myself to you know if I want to go back and like do a performance tomorrow itself um or like put something out um tomorrow itself that's totally fine uh I'm not limiting myself but I'm allowing myself to also, you know, step back from it to look at the larger picture because uh, I was never I was never the kind of person who would just create and create and create um mm. to, you know, like to to find myself in a loop. I wouldn't do that. I think I would only share something if I was genuinely uh excited about it. Mm. If I wrote a poem and I thought, "Hey, this is good. I I like what I wrote," then I would, you know, put it out there. but at the same time i didn't want to be stuck in that loop because i i think at one point i sat myself down and i told myself mega you're not the kind of person who can there there may be people who can write every day and you know share their work with the public every day i know so many spoken word poets who given a brief they'll be able to write a poem memorize that and mm. perform it the next day in front of camera no. and i need like almost like 2 months to even put myself in front of a camera 
and i definitely need a month to memorize a poem because i i can memorize it in like 15 minutes but mm. i don't know if i i don't i don't it's impossible for me to stand in front of a crowd and say that because i need it as muscle memory like i need to be like even if i'm pre, like frozen with fear on stage the words should still tumble out and that's why i need like that long a time period to prepare myself um so i told myself i can't do it um if i do that someone else if they do it every day they may still come up with something great maybe there are people out there who can do quantity and quality i just wasn't that person i mean i had to like um i had to move at my own pace and that's something i realized if i didn't i knew that i was not going to create a legacy and that's something i had told myself that when i write i'm not just going to write i'm i'm here i'm going to create a legacy and that's what i want i don't want to be here for everyday validation so i think a lot of it has to just do with self awareness um it's it's like you wake up every day and you hold on to that sliver of self awareness and that's just it talk much self awareness i think also it kind of comes down to what really drives you in your creative process right so fitting out deep down into that part um especially because you are doing it in i would say three different mediums there's the writing part which is obviously the most i find writing to be the most interesting one of all and like i have found that to be the most um gratifying because you're not worried you're really sitting there and just doing it with yourself right it's just what there then comes the podcast part which is a narrational part it's still you adding a few more people into the mix but it's still you can do it in a cocoon you don't necessarily have to be out there and then there's the stage which is like <laughs> you're in front of hundreds of people um doing that so like all these three do you feel that you need to find different things to drive you when you're doing each of these or does it innately kind of stick to the same point um or i or, or do you find different drivers for each of them no it's um it's very different for me at least um you know with writing it's just the most intimate personal process and also extremely easy you know when people ask me how how do you write about such difficult themes like yeah. does it you know affect you how do you feel about it and i i never thought about it like that for me i think i think when you're just spilling it's it's kind of vital that kind of catharsis so for me writing that way has always been this weapon it's been medicine but then then take it to the next step right performing for audio nobody is really watching it's still like yeah. you said cocooned um I also really like that because that way I feel like I'm just talking to myself. So I get to like you know add really personal elements like you know like maybe it's that small giggle in between two words maybe it's that sucking in your breath at like after pausing maybe it could be anything okay it could be a whisper it could be anything versus going up on stage i mean there are two kinds of stages right one is like it's still like an intimate setting where mm-hmm. you know you're inside a space and then of yeah. course there's like this stage where it's facing this ground and it's outside wow that one yeah. that one still scares me like anything um the normal stage the intimate one i would still say okay you can still get to do what you do with the podcast but now you're also burdened with looking into the eyes of a lot of people and eye contact is so important for that for performance so um so yeah like you're talking to all these strangers you're you're bearing yourself it's it's a bit intimidating but uh i mean that's how it started out for me extremely intimidating but with time i also realized that it was such a transcendental um process for me like it was phenomenal being up there and you know you feel like you feel like you're looking back at the universe and you know i just i thought it was so powerful and being on an open ground kind of stage oh the effect is like a million times more and i know it i know that one time when you know there were like thousands of people on ground is like watching and you know i'm performing this 8 minute piece and i'm mm. i could slip any moment i know that because you know there are many times when you're yelling and your voice cracks you don't know and it was that kind of a piece and it was really fast in some places 
and you're like oh, okay i don't want to slip but i think when you spent 2 3 months preparing for it every day like this is what you've waited for all your like life that disappears i think for me that's what it was i when i go up on stage every single time when i go up on stage which is why i try my best not to do it too often because that kind of destroys it for me i yeah. want to do it rarely because then i feel the passion so every time i go up on stage it feels like i don't know like i'm it it's it's very different you know it's very like i said transcendental it feels otherworldly um like i'm i'm in space and uh, <laughs> like i'm space walking and i remember after it was done i went all the way back to the like you know the ground lawn and i just like lay there and i was facing the sky and it was at night and there were stars and i was like this is as close as i can get to the stars and i think i think it gives you this very strange kind of high that you know you you just feel this adrenaline rush and i think that's that's the difference for me everything's equally beautiful um, yeah. but i think stage ha- is what has given me that kind of adrenaline rush especially when like you're performing poetry that you've written and it's so personal and oh wow it's it's just something else now, you also make an interesting point right is that people try and, and i think because of i think it's partially fomo it's partially many other things for a lot of us we say okay this is the most impactful thing so let me do more of this um <laughs> this is uh what i can do easily so let me just make it like you know the tendency to make anything into daily content is so high um like i struggle with trying to have a calendar because i don't want to have a calendar but at sometimes i know i need to have a calendar to organize my own head so when look at this exact point of saying not doing everything all the time but really spacing it out do you feel that's like a great driver to also find more things to put out like in terms of like you know does it give you more sparks because you are spacing things out that you are bring that energy like you said um rather than just like almost like burning yourself out i th- i feel is what happens a lot these days yeah it happens people burn out they don't give themselves enough time to recover from it um you're right people have this fear of missing out um but you know in that book that your sister gave you um <laughs> So Jenny Odell says that there's something called no more which means necessity of missing out mm-hmm. which is so vital uh, to for all of us and it's something that everyone should do once in a while um to just miss out and not feel like you know you're being isolated um or that someone's going to forget you i think that's that's the biggest fear for a lot of artists in this um century right or this era we are so scared of being forgotten mm. why Mo- maybe because we ourselves forget most of the content that we put out to be honest there's so much that we put out like i think about my catalog whatever i've written there are forgettable poems like if i think back i can only name a handful of poems that stuck with me and that's going to happen a lot more if we keep putting stuff out all the time we can i mean Honestly it's great if there's mm. nobody's there's no gatekeeping here it's not like you can only put your best work out everything else is like oh put it to a side throw it in the bin no 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 it's great if you're sharing everything but it also really restricts you because like you said you're going to hit that burnout real soon you're just creating and creating and creating and it's so unhealthy like mm. it's genuinely so unhealthy not just on an emotional level but also on a creative level it's not good for your creative health how do you look at competition because i feel often times what we also feel is oh this is this is how people are doing it or we come up with people who we think are are competitors because they're also in the same space so every time like i know that sometimes people say you could look at this what this podcaster is doing or what this entrepreneur is creating as content etc it's only that the back of my head i know there is competition as much as i don't want to admit it i know it's there how do you look at competition does that play on your mind um, or or are you are you saying no i i, I don't necessarily let that affect me for me competition is always i tr- i think about it in a very i don't know i think that i just if someone 
someone grabs my attention mm. that way i i would like to be inspired by them rather than trying to like imitate them or like mm. doing what they do or you know figuring out what their formula is what's that secret ingredient that they have that it's working and then you just become bitter and i feel like this competitive culture is it's i mean competition is important because yeah. if there was no competition we would all be like i don't know i know i know a lot of us wouldn't push us to our highest potential mm. um but you know healthy competition is like you know the kind of competition where you feel inspired by someone and you also like recommend them to someone like you hear about someone should be like oh they're doing well i want to do that well i eat like it's more like it's like i remember reading this person's oh i i kind of lurk around reddit a lot so <laughs> i remember like reading this person's opinion where they were like jealousy is when you're like i don't want that person to have that mm. and envy is like i want what that person has yeah. and i think that that's still reasonably healthy because you're still aspiring to reach somewhere versus you thinking oh they have that and i don't want them to have it only mm. i should have it i think we should all just like build each other up um yeah. i think that's that's i think that's beautiful and i think that's that's very healthy and i think that it's also like necessary i i i think that's as positive as positive could get a large part of your work um talks about really personal experiences right um i mean i i've i've run through parts of of your book i i haven't finished it yet i think i'm i'm also like i'm letting it soak in a little bit i'm not letting it be one of those things you finish over a weekend scenario i'm just letting it letting many parts kind of soak <laughs> in and i love reflecting on things so i i've been doing that um i go back to some of your episodes as well uh where you talk about specific things that have happened in your life specific experiences and kind of base it on that um has that ever been a conflict in your head because often times you when you're putting something which is so deeply personal out there there is a worry that okay i'll be judged those people have points of view do people need to have a point of view on my on my own life or or is the value of you channeling it to for just like create to, to put a creative out there um far far beyond that i think it really started or you know was born in this very vulnerable space when i didn't even realize that you know people were reading it honestly at that time i was you know i just had like a couple of like 100 facebook friends or something people in my mm. college and my target audience was them and it wasn't like oh i want them to read it and think wow this is so pretty i love this i relate to this no i i have had like experiences where i was ambushed and i started crying in the middle of the ground with all these people surrounding me and mm. yelling things at me and you know it was like 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 it was bad um people would say stuff and there was no escaping it not at that moment right like there was no getting up and saying how dare you call me that may some somebody could have died but i was numb no. and then i would run back to my hostel with all these unaddressed emotions which a lot of it was grief now i realize um oh but i kind of covered it up with rage you know like mm. it was grief under all of it was grief <laughs> but at the surface was this burning rage and i was like i have to have the last word and i had nothing left to lose at that point by the way and i had no friends i started writing and i would like put up all these poems kind of like a rant kind of like hate poems and sad poems where in the end i'd again be like threatening them and being all vengeful it was a different time and i'd put it out there hoping like these people would see it Mm. and I, i i thought because they were so long like these were like really long poems most people would skip it like my aunts my uncles like, yeah whatever um mm. but then like i wanted these kids to read it because i knew they were targeting me so they would look at it that was the whole point of it oh but what ended up happening was i never found out if they read it but i started getting a lot of messages from random people telling me that they you know they sobbed to it they cried to it they could understand it at a point when i couldn't understand what was happening to me like i mm. i didn't know how to address it see i didn't know that 
I didn't know anything at that point. Like I knew nothing. I I did I had I didn't even know about therapy. I didn't even know that something was wrong with me. I didn't even know that you know this is called trauma or PTSD or whatever. Um, I didn't know. I was just feeling all of these things, and writing was just this safe space. And yeah. I think that's when it started there in that vulnerable place. It was so important to me because I always say that art saved my life. It actually did. so to come to a point where i'm just creating art and creating art without really you know respecting it without really letting it come to me um i just i can't do it i can't detach myself from that very obvious blatant vicious vulnerability that i've always had and i think that is why it comes from personal space it's so important for me to retain that because that's where it all started and apart from that it also acts as this secret place because sometimes when you're just sharing something with someone you still know that the narrator is you mm. you're like still saying listen this happened to me but when you're writing it in a poem there's a lot of mystery around it yeah. see there's a lot of honesty for sure but also mystery because people like is she talking about herself probably it's definitely autobiographical but mm. Oh uh, we still don't know what's exaggeration what's what really happened what didn't it's it's you know what happened but at the same time there's still like that shield of mystery that's protecting you and i love that because i'm not a kind of person who can just like directly talk to people i i'm a very private person but at the same time it's through poetry that i actually tackle the personal and convey it to people i, I think that's super interesting point right because i feel that's where art really comes from you're channelizing things which are you have in your mind experience you had really put out there but what you just said about the mystery i think that there's something there which um we sometimes miss these days i miss that a lot in content all content is to be as clear as possible now i also worked in television for a long time so i went like lowest common denominator was always the term that was used uh Do you feel that the nuance is something you build up naturally, or is that nuance kind of something you learn over time? Because oftentimes, when you're putting a point across, that mystery, that adding that layer to make people like it almost draws people in. But how did you build that into your craft? I think that's very inherent because, like I said, um, you know, I'm someone who wants to write about stuff, but also I'm a very private person, hmm. so I'm not gonna like go and tell people. my story like it's a story i'm not going to anything like i i i'm a very quiet even at home um it's my family always comes in you don't tell us anything that's happening in your <laughs> life like you don't you don't tell us anything so i'm walking around with like so many secrets and i mean even i mean poetry is the only channel where i could put it out there in the you know closest way um so when i'm hiding stuff even when i'm writing poetry I think that's just it just happens naturally. I I want to with withhold I want I mean it's it's like there's a very thin shield or thin shield that separates reality from what's reality for me like what was actually real and what I perceived as real because those are those could be two completely different things. But um, I I'd like to believe that it's it's quite inherent. I have to ask you this because, and I think it's a great uh, point to bring this one up. Is to say that um, who motivates you? Like, if you have to look at okay, X, Y, and Z are people who I mean, I'm not using people. I'm going to leave it at who who motivates who 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 helps bring motivation into you. I think so much of what I create is inspired by, um, you know, like family, friends. I don't write about them, but mm-hmm. let's say like a lot of my own. personal opinions and the way i see the world it's definitely influenced by like the five people i'm most in touch with but apart from that um i mean i i also keep to myself a lot so like there's a lot of stuff going on in my head um and so that's how i see the world i my own thoughts ideas inspire me but externally like whatever i like to read um i really love joan didion she's uh, she passed away recently um 
but she's a phenomenal essayist. She's I I really love her work because there's something very um crisp and real about it about the way she writes. It's like there's no word that's out of place and I really like that. Like she's really good with craft. Um apart from that literary influences I've been reading KR Meera a lot right now. I I like her work because she's from Kerala and yeah. she's also like the the way she tackles this very sensitive topic. Um I I like it. I like I like that there's no beating around the bush. There's just like direct narration. Um poetry I mean my primary influence would be Sylvia Plath. Um I just that's where I started learning that there was something called confessional poetry. Uh it's been a while since I read Plath, but I know during um I think it, she formed a big part of understanding my identity during my growing years and my early 20s. Um and there are many other poets that I really like like Darwish and you know um also Rimbaud who's a french poet uh, very you know he writes with so much of grandeur it's it's really comp- it's really compelling um but apart from that like if i weren't to look at writers mm. i think as an individual like overall i'm really inspired by frida kahlo and i get really <laughs> aggravated when other people say that they like frida kahlo because then i i start like hitting them with questions okay you like her <laughs> um what is your favorite painting that she made because most people who like i've come across who told me that they like frida kahlo like her because everyone else likes her and you know because yeah. there's something called you know you know the whole concept of frida mania where people got so obsessed with the artist that yeah. they you know the artist just became bigger than the art like people who have heard of frida kahlo who love frida kahlo can't like they don't know what she's painted they know everything about her life about who she married about you know like about her health issues they know that you know she's a feminist they know a lot of things about her but they don't know about her paintings and you know i hope that never happens to any artist because the artist is always bigger than the artist it shouldn't be the other way around and I'm I mean I see that happening quite a bit these days where people artists put themselves in the limelight and the art yeah. takes a back seat and uh, I I don't want to be that way but Frida Kahlo for me is an inspiration because um because I really love love the way she puts the personal in her painting like she literally I mean I'm not just talking about the self portraits I'm just talking about everything that she creates that's this element of her identity integrated in it and i i think that's very inspiring also like some of the like she also writes which i don't i don't know like i don't i want to talk about that because like some of the letters that she's written are so full of passion and urgency and you know it's so raw and i really like that and i think that that's that's the kind of vitality i want to have when i'm approaching life um and that's very inspiring for me you mentioned legacy a while back and i'm just bring that here because of what you just said and saying that do you feel there's more this better legacy or more stronger legacy when the art is first uh, is before the artist rather than the artist being before the art do you see that being do you think there's more legacy there in that sense so as human beings we all have like limited time on earth mm. it's like what maximum 100 years mm. and then once we die we're dead we're gone art is something that cannot die and i think this is what most artists need to realize years later like years down the line like when i mean i am talking i'll talk about myself like centuries later i'm underground i'm one with the earth and nobody's going to be like oh did you know mega rao this is mega rao i mean they could be did you follow her on instagram <laughs> oh yeah um yeah or did you see her website no that's not going to happen yeah 
I mean, it could, but it it doesn't. I mean, what kind of conversation is that? It's like it ends there. It's like a one-liner. Um, versus someone reading something you wrote, sitting there sobbing in the middle of the night, twelve a.m. when they thought that they couldn't move forward with life, whether it's a fourteen-year-old girl or a seventy-year-old person, anything, right? If you could touch their life. in that second in that one second it should mean more than someone saying oh you want to hear about megara you want to hear about this artist i think i think that's where it gets muddled right i think that it's so important for an artist to observe rather than be observed only then can you create so many of us want to be observed that we forget to observe and also like you know you i don't know for me i think i think i've just thought too much about this which is why i'm like i have this very specific opinion about it but i always i think i know that no matter what i want the art to live on because i think that's how we make our mark in the world and that's how we're going to help future generations to you know understand themselves too because people before me writers before me helped me understand myself so i want to i want to that's the le- that's the legacy i'm talking about too it's not just my legacy but like legacy of all of literature we're just passing it down and i think i think that's what we're doing now uh, if i had to ask you one part of what your process is to write which you feel that um you'd want more than what people should should follow but more like this something which which has really worked for you have to pick one thing from your process what would that be so i start from the end and then hmm. i figure the rest out i don't just jump into a poem or like a, a novel or whatever or even like a podcast episode i don't just start with one line and then wonder where to go or see where it's going i need to know how it ends whether it's a book whether it's you know a poem a poem definitely i want my last line to be the best line okay so you know like i feel like for me when i write i write all these this beautiful stuff and in the end i you know it's it doesn't stay with the reader mm-hmm. then i feel like the poem's forgettable um i know that's that's a very rigid way of thinking because i've never felt that way when i'm reading someone else's poem but for my own creative process it's kind of this rule that i employ i just don't feel satisfied if the ending isn't good Yeah. Um so I start from the end like I only write a poem if I have like that one last line in my head I'm like oh yes okay now I I can write this poem. I think that's so true right I mean how often have you heard someone turn around and say you oh, know the movie was good but you know they didn't they didn't know how to end it or the ending <laughs> was bad you know, so often times I feel that that needs to be thought out a lot more we get obsessed with the concept of it. Um and speaking of endings um I think we pretty much reached the end of this conversation. I, I, I keep going on and go deeper and down this rabbit hole, but you've given me a great way to end it. We spoke about ending uh, and where you should actually start off with the end and kind of build things back. Um, uh, Mega, thank you so much for doing this. This is uh, this is exactly what and more of what I'd hope this conversation would be about. Thank you for for taking a pause on on take a pause with me, um, and uh, I'm looking forward to consuming more of. the art that you create I, maybe i won't say content i'm going to say art uh that you create <laughs> we started um, with content i started with content i ended with art see we got it from there <laughs> oh you converted me in one hour from using the word content to calling to using the word art but uh, thank you so much for doing this i mean, i have a ton of stuff which i've i i'm going to going to soak in and think about especially my need to overshare uh, and create too much content But uh, thank you so much for coming on the show, and it's been. Oh no! Been I mean, you should definitely overshare and create too much content, but it shouldn't be because you feel pressurized. It should yeah. just be because you want to. Like some people can really create something like like five hundred poems in yeah. a month. That that's cool. Like yeah. do whatever you want. Just the external influence. That's that's yeah. what's worrying. That's that's actually what I I fall into so often. So it's it's a. Uh, something which i need to kind of stop myself from doing more of thank you so much for having me i mean i i really really enjoyed this conversation it was really beautiful i hope this conversation gave you deeper insight into staying present moving away from social media yet being able to evolve into the kind of person you can be lots more like this dropping and for that to kind of show in your feed to make sure you hit subscribe and smash that bell icon